Okay, well, good evening, community members. Welcome to our program, the third of three vaccination decisions. What does the future hold? My name is Susan Heilman. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm part of the community engagement team here at the Museum of Science. Thank you all for joining us. I'm especially excited about our lineup for this topic. And I'm gonna start with just a few housekeeping items and then we'll begin the official program. First of all, thank you to the Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies of Johnson & Johnson for supporting the museum's COVID-19 initiatives and the upcoming exhibition. If you'd like to see captions, you can click on the closed caption button. It's probably at the bottom of your Zoom and select show subtitles. If you have questions throughout this evening, please type them in the chat. Um, specifically to me, Susan, and I will then be able to pass them on. You can do that by clicking on the chat button, button at the bottom of the screen and selecting my name. After about 45 minutes, our panel will conclude and we'll begin the discussion portion of our event for those that would like to stay and participate. So we're in meeting format for this entire program and we're gonna keep you muted and your video off for this first portion. And we'll spotlight the speakers for your ideal viewing. Um, and if you'd like to stay for and participate in the discussion afterwards, just remain as you are and we will give you further guidance at the end. And if you choose to stay, we will be offering you a $25 e-gift card as an appreciation of your time with us. And now without any further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce the president of the Museum of Science, Tim Ritchie. Thank you, Susan. And it is a pleasure to see you all tonight. I am Tim Ritchie. My pronouns are he and him. And it's a real honor to be the president of the Museum of Science during this moment, which for all of us is such a moment of public science decision making. And this third part of our series on vaccinations decisions focuses on what does the future hold? And one thing we can say that the future holds, vaccinations will be with us for a very long time. And in the near future, some very big decisions will be happening. First of all, will adults get vaccinated? And then even more difficult conversations perhaps about when children will be vaccinated. Is it safe for them to be vaccinated? But it won't end this year. Vaccination decisions will continue in the years to come as we deal with the coronavirus, as we deal with the flu, as we deal with many, many other things where the community has to rise up and say, we will get vaccinated or perhaps we won't. And the answer to that will determine our fate as a community, it really will. It will determine what kind of community we become. It will determine what kind of future we have. It will determine what the new normal looks like. And so with that, we're really excited to have this conversation tonight. And I'm pleased to welcome our moderator, Sabrina Schultz. Sabrina is the curator of biological anthropology at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. And as it relates to this subject, she was the lead curator of the exhibition, Outbreak, Epidemics in a Connected World. So what could be more relevant? And we're pleased to welcome you, Sabrina Schultz. Oh, Sabrina, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that, Tim, and thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm really delighted to be your moderator for this conversation and uh, for this conversation. And before we get started, uh, please allow me to follow suit and introduce our panelists. Uh, Marisol Amaya Luigi is the executive director of La Alianza Hispana a nonprofit community organization founded in Boston in 1970 with a mission to improve the lives of the Latino community of Massachusetts. Marcel was born and raised in Columbia, South America. She has a master's degree in public health from Boston University and a bachelor's of science degree in bacteriology with a concentration in microbiology from the Pontifical University of Ariana in Columbia. She's dedicated to making it possible for all members of society to receive healthcare services and her goal and her passion is to empower individuals and families, to strengthen our communities, and to help develop the new leaders of future generations. Casey Baines is passionate about the ways that she can serve her community and call attention to social justice issues impacting marginalized communities. She continues uh, that mission, uh, the mission of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce in the role of Senior Policy and Communications Manager. 
Casey previously served on Mayor Walsh's Spark Council for Millennial Engagement and currently serves as an advisory board member for the Women's Lunch Place, a daytime women's shelter in Boston. She serves on the board of directors of the Boston Theater Company and the Esplanade Association. She has a BA from Swarthmore, an MA from Duke University, and a JD from Boston University School of Law. And last but not least, Larry Madoff is an infectious disease physician specializing in the epidemiology of infectious diseases, bacterial pathogenesis, and international health. He has served as medical director of the Bureau of Infectious Disease and Laboratory Sciences for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and is on their COVID-19 leadership team. He is professor of medicine at the University of Massachusetts Medical School and a lecturer on medicine at Harvard Medical School. Since 2002, Larry has directed the International Society for Infectious Diseases Program for Monitoring Emerging Diseases, PROMET, uh, and serves as editor of PROMET. He is a graduate of Yale College and Tufts Medical School, and he performed his internal me medicine residency at uh, New York Hospital Cornell Medical Center and his Infectious Disease Fellowship at the Harvard Medical School Longwood Program. And I will also add that Larry serves as an advisor on the Smithsonian's Outbreak Exhibit and has been a tremendous supporter and content expert in helping with its development. So thank you so much. Um, it, really, we've, we've got a phenomenal panel of experts here to talk about vaccines, vaccine decisions, uh, and your questions about them. So we're gonna try to cover as many questions as possible during our limited time, including those that uh, some folks submitted when they registered for this event. But the first question uh, that I would like to uh, start with and ask all three of our panelists, and I think we maybe we'll start with Larry and then Casey and then Marisol. Have you or will you receive the vaccine for COVID-19? And what do you think is most important for people to know about it? So Larry, can you start? Sure, thank you, uh, Sabrina, and thank you to the Museum of Science for hosting this event and for inviting uh, the Department of Public Health and me to participate in this event. Um, I am um, sort of amazed that vaccines are with us uh, so quickly for COVID. The fact that uh, we have safe and effective vaccines for this disease, you know, within a year of its discovery is, um, is really, uh, uh, to me is nothing short of miraculous and I'm um, very um, pleased that, that um, these vaccines are available and as a, as a healthcare worker, as someone who works in the Department of Public Health and actually was doing um, testing of people for COVID-19, um, I'm a frontline healthcare worker and so was vaccinated really as, as soon as I possibly could, um, actually in, in, in late December. I got my first dose of the of Pfizer vaccine and uh, three weeks later, the second dose. And so in, in the category of fully vaccinated and, and very pleased uh, of that. I um, you know, also have urged my, my friends, my loved ones, my family members, uh, my colleagues to get vaccinated as soon as, as they're eligible and as soon as the vaccine is available to them. And um, I, I heartily in, endorse them. Fantastic, thank you, Larry. Casey, how about you? How, have you, will you get the vaccine and, and what do you wanna say about it? Yeah, thanks, Sabrina. And thank you to the Museum of Science for having me here virtually. This is such a powerful program and I'm so grateful to the team for putting this together, um, you know, for drafting all the questions, having the pre-meeting with us. Um, you know, this is such an important topic and I, I personally have not been vaccinated yet, but I have pre-registered on the state's uh, site. So I'm in line, which is very exciting. Um, you know, even that pre-registration process for me was a sigh of relief, right? And as Larry described it this past year, um, seeing the, vaccinate, the vaccinations um, be talked about and developed um, publicly, 
seeing the rollout and seeing people get needles in arms. I never thought that I'd be excited to see my friends getting stuck with needles. Um, but this is where we are. You know, it's it's a moment to um, celebrate and make sure that we're centering equity um, during all of this um, to make sure that we, we all get vaccinated. Um, my parents live in Maryland and they got vaccinated a couple weeks ago um, along with some other family members who live in other states. And it's just it's it's amazing. So I haven't been vaccinated yet, but I can't wait. Sabrina, I'm going to send you a selfie when I do get vaccinated. <laughs> oh, and I'll do the same for you because I'm yeah. eagerly awaiting myself in Washington, <laughs> D.C. Uh, okay, Marisol, same to you. Um, if you there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I got vaccinated like uh, one month ago. We had a big senior program here at La Alianza. So we dealing with a lot of high risk population. So we got the vaccine and it's such an important tool to stop the pandemic. And also we have been motivating seniors, helping them to sign up for the appointments and also taking to the vaccination sites for the seniors. So one thing I have to say to everyone is, and always say don't, listen to people saying crazy stuff, all those misinformation, mythos, social media has been bombarded with things that scare people. So I say, don't, li don't look at that kind of social media and just go to your PCP or health provider and ask questions, ask questions and you are afraid to do it. So by go, the vaccine is great and we feel so free now. Pretty happy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that is some good advice. Uh, and Casey had, had, had really called out, um, and you were also so speaking to it, Marcel. Um, another issue that, that I'd like to sort of uh, go to next um, that covers a number of questions that we got from the audience, and that's about equity. Um, to end this pandemic as soon as possible, it's really important that our vaccination efforts are rapid, that they're effective, and that they're equitable. And so I want to ask each one of you, and I think maybe we'll go in the reverse, right? So we'll go back to you, Marissa, and the Casey, and then Larry. To ensure that underserved communities and those disproportionately affected by COVID-19 are equitably vaccinated, what do you think are our biggest challenges and what do we need to be doing better? So our biggest challenges are the health disparities, such as language, technology, time, transportation and the trust. Uh, we need to reduce those. So we are bringing now the vaccine, the vaccination size to the community, it needs to be bringing to the community, to the community health centers, to the uh, group community centers, to places where really they are going, where they feel comfortable to go, because the people, we have to reduce like no asking for essential documentation, be able to be talking in the same language, accessible to public transportation, and the trust, the trust that people who are leaders, people who know that the community know. It's really amazing in the beginning. I know that the health department has done amazing job, has been put in a lot of resources, but we need to work together. We need to work together because everybody needs to be vaccinated who wants to get it. Absolutely. Casey, did you want to uh, address this as well? Yes. Um, thank you, Marcel, for those comments, too. I was nodding vigorously as you were making <laughs> each point. Um, I completely agree. You know, I think that from the business community, you know, the chamber has been um, convening and acting as an amplifier during this time, right? Trying to make sure that um, businesses understand how to support their employees during this time, making sure that they understand, you know, how to communicate all of this out because Marisol raised so many great points. And, and part of this is, is the communication, 
right? Like all of this is changing day by day, uh, sometimes hour by hour. So making sure that we have the most up-to-date information um, and then pushing it out accurately is, is key. You know, I will say um, specifically seeing our um, hospitality workers, our restaurant workers get vaccinated the last couple of days. I've seen that increase over social media. And that has been a hard hit sector. Um, you know, our, our restaurants have been shut down and, and many people of color, uh, many immigrants are working in that sector. And, you know, they, we, we need the equity there as well. So it's been wonderful to see that increase. And um, I know in the coming days, it will just increase any even more. Um, you know, I will, I will also echo this piece of the racial inequities. Um, some of this is embedded in historical relationships between communities of color and the medical community, right? So um, when there are misconceptions about the vaccine or feelings of not trusting um, the vaccine, we, again, that communication is so important so that we um, build back that trust, right? That for years, years previously, generations previously um, was broken down. So it's, it is, it's, it's a good thing to see that trust being built up um, between communities of color and the medical field. Um, so I'll pause there. Thank you, Sabrina. Well, I mean, that's that's a good cue for Larry as a, a member, a representative of the medical field. If Larry, you'd like to sure. add to that. Yeah, this is such an important issue, um, Sabrina and Marisol and Casey, this is, and to all of you here today. Uh, equity is um, really central to what the Department of Public Health is, is working towards. The COVID-19 um, pandemic did not strike all communities equally. And uh, it, it really disproportionately impacted um, communities of color in particular, um, Latinx communities, uh, people who were frontline workers who couldn't stay home and telework, people who had to be out there and taking uh, public transportation or um, working in, in, in tight settings where, where you know, social distancing wasn't possible. Um, it had disproportionately impacted older, um, older people uh, who were certainly more susceptible and um, to the complications and mortality of, of COVID. Uh, and, and so it, it isn't, um, it, the de department's focus is, is not just on equality in a sense, not just making the vaccine available to everyone or making it equally available. Um, we, we really uh, tried to reach out to those most impacted to get the vaccine um, to them first and, and continue those efforts to try to promote vaccine um, uptake in the communities that are most affected and have been most affected by COVID-19. And this is you know, part of what we, what we call equity. So it's not just saying, here's the vaccine, good luck. Um, it, it means really promoting it in these communities, making it easily available, as, as Marisol alluded to, bringing down barriers to vaccination. It can be transportation or um, language or, or other issues that can make it harder to get at the vaccine. And um, DPH has, has really made equity a focus um, since, since the, the beginning of the outbreak. And we've really tried to reach out to, we've identified um, communities that were particularly impacted by COVID and have launched a, a, a drive to, to reach the 20 uh, cities and towns in Massachusetts that were most affected and have made special funding available to these communities. We, we wanna work with, listen to, engage with the communities and use organizations within the communities uh, to, to, to reach people who might otherwise be hesitant or, or, or for whom the vaccine might be less available. So I, I'll, I'll stop there, but equity is just so important in this whole conversation. Yeah, it really is. And I appreciated everyone's perspective on this. Um, I mean, you may, may disagree or not, um, or, with, with sort of um, what I was hearing uh, was a lot of sort of meeting people where they are, right? Physically um, in terms of, of, of language and then in other ways, you know, that um, 
it, it's not enough just to say, here you go, or here it is, or we've gotten this far. And, you know, you were saying at the end there, Larry, you know, you're talking about also, um, and, and Marcel, and I think everyone has, has touched on this, um, uh, hesitancy, um, uh, misinformation, uh, as we've established, I mean, everyone needs to get vaccinated for, for all of us to be safe, or we need as many people as possible. And, and those are real challenges. Um, and so I guess because you were speaking more specifically to this, uh, Marisol, I might start with you. And again, we'll go maybe um, Marisol, then uh, and Larry, and then Casey, just to mix it up. Um, uh, what do you think are the most effective messages or strategies to convince vaccine hesitant or vaccine skeptical people to get vaccinated, um, perhaps from your own experience? I think it will be to understand the person or the group of people that we had to convince or we had to talk. So we had to understand their concern and clarify what the questions they have. People had a lot of questions. They, a lot of, like I said in the beginning, misunderstand the methods and we had to educate people. But the education has to come linguistical and cultural appropriate and really accessible to every single one. So people can feel relief, people can understand that the vaccine is not something that is going to hurt the body or feel bad, it's going to be better. That is why many people in the community start to get it so we can show others that it's okay. We have been seniors to the vaccination sites and taken pictures and they have been also talking with other seniors saying everything is okay. One senior was doing like this, so happy to, to be vaccinated. But also we had to make the vaccine really available because we had in the beginning a lot of frustration and after a lot of time consuming, convincing a group of people, um, they couldn't get it in, in the appointments and the motivation was lost. So we need to be between education and vaccination available to be able to convince those people. But education has to be cultural and linguistical appropriate. No everybody is in the same page. No everybody is in the same level. So we had to do it really like that. Thank you. And I think I was gonna to go to Larry next. I mean, I am curious, Larry, from your, your perspective, um, you know, is in public health um, and then even today, you know, we've seen potentially some confusion around, around vaccines, their efficacy, their safety, and then what you've found in your work. Sure, so, and of course it doesn't start with COVID, right? Vaccine um, confidence is an issue that um, has, has been with us for since, since there were vaccines and um, is something that we um, try to address all the time in our public health work and in our immunization programs. Um, we, we're, we're, we're lucky in Massachusetts, we have um, really good immunization uptake where pediatricians in particular are fantastic at, at promoting and making sure that our kids are, are safely vaccinated against um, you know, many, many illnesses and vaccines save millions of lives every year. It's not just COVID. But with COVID in particular, um, you know, this vaccine was rolled out quickly. As I said, it's almost miraculous that we have safe and effective vaccines so soon after a new disease is, is discovered. And so uh, well, right now, demand for the vaccines, you know, is, is way out, out, outstripping the supply, unfortunately. And so, um, vaccine confidence isn't so much of an issue right now, but I think as we move forward um, and vaccines become more readily available, we're gonna to start to see issues around vaccine confidence become more important. And there are many reasons for, for a, a lack of confidence in vaccines and they can stem from um, misunderstandings, uh, they can stem from um, you know, feelings of autonomy and wanting you know, agency and wanting to um, a sense of control that can stem from mistrust of, of government or from medicine, which, you know, and, and um, from institutional racism, which has unfortunately, uh, you know, been, been with us for, for, for so long. Um, 
people are, are people of color in particular are, are, are mistrustful of, of the medical community. And it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a long-standing problem. So I think it's our job to, um, to, to promote vaccine confidence, to try to overcome misconceptions, misunderstandings, certainly, but also um, to, to, to be completely transparent and honest about um, all of the issues that surround vaccines. Um, there are side effects of vaccines. We need to admit that and address them. There are um, safety concerns. We need to be completely transparent and open. Um, and you know that's why um, you know that's why it's in the news today is that there are you know issues of mistrust. And I think that's um, something that's unfortunate. I think again, it, it's our job to um, to understand, to engage, listen to why people are, are, are hesitant about a vaccine um, and to try to address those concerns. I will say one thing that we know about vaccines is that the, the best um, way to promote vaccines is, is a strong recommendation from, from a person's healthcare provider. So if I, uh, if I have a patient and I say to this patient, this vaccine is right for you, um, this vaccine, I, I have gotten this vaccine or would get this vaccine. I would recommend it for my uh, loved ones, for my family members, um, and, and you should get it today. Uh, that's important. Making vaccines routine so that it's not something special, but it's just something that you get when you, when you go in. And I think right now, you know, basically everyone should get um, COVID vaccine when they can so that we can stop this uh, outbreak and stop this pandemic. I think it's just important for us to, to say that, but also to listen. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Casey, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on this from your expertise, your world. Um, I'm sure, you know, sort of the idea of getting through this as soon as possible must factor into um, the kind of messaging, communication, and, and, and ways you deal with uh, confidence maybe. Yes, definitely. Um, you know, this, this question is so deep. Um, and the answers are even deeper, right? And I think that this piece about continuing to convene, um, just like this town hall is bringing people in, um, listening to them, um, gathering all the questions to try to answer as many as possible, continuing that effort from as many communities as possible to um, directly answer questions, directly see the concerns. Um, you know, I, I will admit that during this past year, I personally have felt scared sometimes or I felt um, like I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel, right? Like all of this was so overwhelming. But when um, I felt like I was being heard, that made such a difference when I felt like I was being seen, um, especially as a black woman, that, I, that my the generational issues that were at play um, with the medical community that that was being talked about and acknowledged, that was a really powerful moment and shifted things for me. Um, so continuing to have town halls like we're having right now, continuing to have convenience and listen is, is really important. I will say also um, from the business community, well, we are I'm really seeing a lot of employers um, incentivize their workforce to get vaccinated. Um, getting creative with, you know, oh, you want to go get vaccinated? Well, you can use your work time, right? You don't have to take paid time off. You can use your work time and get vaccinated. Come come back to the virtual office whenever you're ready. You know, that type of leeway um, can be really helpful. Um, we've seen some employers be you know generous with extra vacation time as an incentive. Um, you've gotten vaccinated. Oh, here's a, a vacation day, an extra one. Um, and you know there is currently a national um, rally for recovery, which is the business community's collective effort um, to really say, you know, what can businesses, um, what can employers do to support the workforce right now? Um, creative thinking around that type of civilization. Um, and then also continuing to message out um, from businesses of all size sizes, um, from big businesses to our main street businesses, um, to our entrepreneurs, like pushing out this message that um, 
we're here to help with the vaccination efforts. The business community is, is working in tandem with the medical community, um, and this is how. So those are, those are some exciting updates that we're seeing. They are, thank you for that. Yeah, and actually, um, speaking of updates, I, I guess uh, we just don't want to run out of time to mention it. Marisol, I am getting some, uh, I'm getting a note that you have an event coming up this week yes. called uh, Vaccination Without Barrier. Would you like to talk about that? Yes, we have um, health education. We had education together with the Boston Public Health Commission and the Greater Boston Latino Network. We are getting together to talk about in Spanish and English and bilingual to talk about the vaccine and how it's helping the whole community. So we are, um, it's a link that's going to be put in, a, in the chat. So everybody more than welcome to come in and listen and bring every single one who is, has questions about it. So that will be a way to target every single person. Thank you. Okay, everyone's got that link. Everyone can see it in the chat box. Okay, um, so, you know, given the, the, the title um, and, and the theme of this, this um, you know, uh, program talking about the, the future, right? Uh, which maybe we, we want to start to get into. You know, I'm looking at a number of questions that we got when people registered about um, everything from what activities can we engage in this summer? What travel can we safely do? How long will we be wearing masks? Um, how long is this going to last if people don't get vaccinated? Uh, I, I understand that you know it, it may be difficult uh, for any of you to speak to specifically or or make predictions about this, but I'm wondering if you might be willing to address at least some of these, maybe within a more general question, if you feel comfortable answering it, um, about when and how we might reach a situation in the U.S. where we do have you know um, a good number of people vaccinated, and then what might that look like? or feel like, how might that differ from what we knew before? Um, Larry, maybe if you'd like to take that question first and then I'll, I'll go maybe to uh, Casey and Marisol. Yeah, um, the, old, the old saying, predictions are hard to make, especially about the future. And uh, this is one of those situations where uh, this pandemic has thrown um, surprises at us uh, continuously and uh, continues to throw surprises at us. So I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to, um, to make too much um, to, to say for sure what will happen um, in the future. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's very likely that uh, this has been a world changing event, that uh, the world won't look exactly like it, it did before the pandemic uh, for, you know, probably ever. And uh, I would point out that there are some things about um, the pandemic, some of our responses to the pandemic, which have even, um, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, lead us to think differently about how, how things happen. I think, um, you know, in my own field of healthcare, um, telehealth has, uh, has been um, so useful to us. And I, I can see that staying with us even after the pandemic ends. Um, I think we've all um, seen the benefits of um, less traffic and pollution and uh, a lower carbon footprint. Um, and maybe we will see more telecommuting um, in, the, in the future and, and, and fewer people um, driving into, into work every day. But um, I, I don't know how, how this is going to end exactly. Other um, pandemics um, have ended either with the eradication, you know, for example, the, the, the case of SARS, the original SARS um, back in 2003, um, ended because all of the cases were gone and we were able to contain it. That doesn't seem like a likely scenario here. Um, there are probably other pandemic scenarios where the virus stays with us. Um, an example would be the flu pandemic of 2009, the H1N1 flu. Now that virus um, is still with us, it exists, it circulates, we vaccinate against it every year um, and people have gradually developed immunity and the virus has also shifted and drifted over time. Um, 
And I think that's more likely scenario for SARS-CoV-2 or COVID is that that virus is going to remain with us as an endemic virus that's never going to go away completely, but that which we, we will adapt to by, by vaccinating, by developing population immunity uh, to it. One of the questions is how many people need to be vaccinated before we achieve herd immunity, or immunity level immunity. And again, we, I don't think we know the answer to that question. We think that this is a pretty transmissible virus, which means we need a lot of people immune to it before uh, transmission is going to go away. And that, that might be as high as 80 or 90 percent of people. Now, some of that immunity happens by infection, and hopefully most of it happens by vaccination. And I, I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to get there. Um, and, and I think when that happens, we'll, we'll gradually see the measures that we've taken to combat the pandemic fall away. You know, people will resume social interaction, people will resume travel, um, maybe masks will stay with us for a while. One of the side benefits of our social distancing and masks has been flu has almost gone away this year. We've seen um, almost no cases of influenza this year. So maybe we've learned some things from the pandemic that will stay with us for a while. Hopefully. Larry, I just want to follow up on one thing. I, I think maybe for some it might be a bit provocative, you know, uh, saying that this virus may be with us for a while. Do you mean the wild type virus? Do you mean variants? Might there be a number of variants that will be with us for a while uh, in your uh, not non-predictive uh, speculation. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. There are a number of other coronaviruses that are, are seasonal coronaviruses that we see in, in our population every year. Um, there is also viruses like every other uh, living organism um, evolve and mutate over time, right? And um, so I think that it's likely that, the, that this coronavirus, because there's so much of it out there and there's so much transmission going on, will continue to evolve. And variants are one feature of evolution is that it's a different um, types of the virus are, are out there. Um, those are certainly likely to continue and, and the virus is likely to, to change over time as almost all viruses do. Thank you. Uh, that's, that's really helpful. Um, Casey, okay, um, would you like to uh, um, uh, jump into this um, with your thoughts on a post-COVID world? When, how, in what ways yeah. um, might we experience yeah, that? <laughs> yes, I mean, it's like everyone is saying, um, a lot of it is unknown, but you know, I think that we're seeing some some hints of what's to stay right in this new normal uh, post COVID. Um, you know, I really do think that equity as a topic as a concern will continue to be um, front and center of people's minds. You know, even after this pandemic is over, um, equity and empathy have really emerged in um, such a robust way during this past year. Um, you know, we've We've seen workforces and workplaces go virtual, um, and we've seen our frontline workers throughout the year um, not able to go virtual. We've, we've been talking about some tough subjects of mental health within our workforce um, for both our frontline workers and for people working from home, um, the isolation. You know, this these type of topics have emerged and I don't think we're going back, right? We've, we've, we've started this conversation. I think people are hungry for more. And so once we're, we all have our vaccinations, once we're um, moving forward and, and going to concerts, I think we're still gonna have those um, really interesting and rich conversations about what does equity mean um, and how do we make Massachusetts truly equitable for everyone. Um, so that everyone can thrive here, right? Um, so that's that's something that's on my mind that I think that I'm I'm excited to see how that plays out with equity being um, you know carried through. 
I think too, you know, it's going to be interesting to see some of the industries I mentioned, um, the hospitality industry, also our artistic, um, our our artists, our creative economy, um, our cultural institutions, how they bounce back from this past year as well. You know, those are our concerts. You know, a virtual concert, while it's, I've gone to some of them over the past year, it's not the same, right? We want to go to concerts in person. Um, So, you know, I've been thinking about those performers, those in-person performers quite a bit, and it's going to be really interesting to see um, them return to the stage, right? And to see the audience return. And consumer behavior is going to drive a lot of this, right? So, um, we might see things lifted, we might see rules change, but um, once the audience decides, you know what, I'm ready for this concert now, I'm ready to get on a plane, I'm ready to do this, um, that's when we're really going to see things uh, drive forward. And um, I know that I'm personally excited to um, get my vaccination and support um, all, the, all the industries that have been hurting the most. Thank you, Casey. That's a nice idea that empathy and equity might be endemic after this. So I guess we shouldn't be calling it post-COVID. If, as Larry's saying, it might not be post-COVID, but post-pandemic. Uh, Marisol, do, would you like to um, uh, add anything about your thoughts on this? Yeah, like uh, Casey and Larry said, it's uh, really difficult to predict the future. It's uh, difficult barriers to know. It need a little bit more investigation and information of how that is it. Uh, I think uh, mask and hand sanitizer will be part of our life for a little bit longer. So people, some people don't feel comfortable still going out. When they say, okay, no more masks, the people will not feel comfortable to go in public places without it. So maybe people will continue using for public places. Events, I think and now summer is coming, so everybody just hoping to have events outside, outdoors, enjoy the outdoors and be out from the homes. People need it just for the uh, mental health part. People need to go out. People need to interact outside. A small events will be part of this. More people will feel comfortable to go to outdoor dinners, restaurants, events, because now they feel a little bit more free. But one of the things we come is a lot of new policies also, a lot of work in health equity. And I hope so they come a lot, not just some, a lot of work in health equity, a lot of work in how to protect our workers, our work, um, people who are in the front lines also help, help the, every single one in the health clinic and things like that. We need to protect them. That was a lot. And also, we will be having more small groups, more relation, small, especially in some group like the, the 40 and older. I don't know about the younger population, how much they feel comfortable they still having a small group, but that will be what we see in the future with people be prepared for something else. Well, thank you all. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. So I think that we have time for one more quick question with rather brief answers. And this is a nice one, I think, to wrap it up. And Casey was kind of talking about this, but we got the question, if and when the world returns to some sort of normalcy, what artistic or cultural activities are you looking forward to enjoying the most um, I don't know Boston well enough um, to, to guess. Sell me, tell me, what, what can't you wait to do? Um, maybe uh, Casey uh, and then, uh, and then Marisol, and then we'll end with Larry. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'm happy to jump into this question. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking about, as you were, you know, saying that question and presenting it to us, I immediately started thinking about summertime, warm weather, um, and, you know, a little bit of travel, maybe to the Cape, um, you know, and enjoying concert after concert. I can't wait to um, be standing amongst my peers, um, 
and neighbors and friends and not have that, you know, worry, right? Uh, which, which I think I've been hearing from a lot of my friends that I, we sort of have that, right? Even though we're glad to see each other, you know, there's that six feet that we have to worry about. Is our mask going correctly? You know, it's just, it's just a lot of brain power. Um, so I'm looking forward to going to a concert um, with some friends, <laughs> dancing to some live music. Um, and I'm looking forward to some travel, um, you know, relaxed travel with no COVID tests <laughs> that I have to worry about. I think those are, those are some things that come to mind. Oh, that sounds great. Marisol, how about you? Really what I miss the most is to be able to welcome people with a big hug and a big kiss. For us, it's so warm to be able to do it. And when people come, it's like a hi, and let's say we cannot be either close. So I really miss that piece, the warm pass to say welcome and say goodbye to someone. I miss also, I hope we can have a outdoor or oh, diners. I miss a lot to go to the restaurants. It's like, oh my God, I was sick and tired to be cooking and also eating the same food over and over because I know the best cook in the planet. So I was getting a little frustrated with that. So I yeah. need to be able to go to a restaurant, go dancing. Go dancing is for us really important, but it's like a, we don't know, we don't have any place to, to go. We cannot go any place. So I miss that part. I miss a lot also for the community. I say that we had every year a big event, like a health care event, so like a big health fair, but we miss that because it's a lot of good things that we can offer to the community. Yeah. Larry, are you missing dancing? What are you going to do? <laughs> uh, um, we have to get you up to Boston so you can see, uh, you know, once once we're able to travel. Um, and uh, there's, there's so much, uh, there's so much here and there's so many things that I've, I've missed doing from um, theater to ball games uh, to, uh, to and, and, and how could we forget museums, which are, are really yes. something that I'm looking forward to, uh, to, to being able to do again, to visit. Um, to visit museums and uh, you know the aquarium and the museum of science and the fine art museum here in Boston, are, 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 I miss them. Yeah, yeah, that is a great way to wrap things up, uh, Larry. And uh, yeah, and, and the museums down in Washington D.C. I will add, um, I can't wait. So. Thank you all. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time for this portion of the program. And so um, I'm going to thank our audience for, for their attention and their questions and uh, hand it back to Tim. And thank you. Thank you, our, Sabrina. <laughs> thank you, Sabrina. And thank you, Marisol and Casey and Larry. And thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. I loved hearing your stories of what you will miss, because those are the things we all miss. The hugs and the ball games and the concerts, and we can all return to them. We can all return to them if our community together comes and does what we know the science is leading us to do. We can even greet the reality of the coronavirus as a friend if we can get vaccinated. What Larry said at the beginning is true. It is a miracle that we have these vaccines, a miracle that we have them. But vaccines really don't matter in a sense, vaccinations do. So that's what we should talk about. I'm so grateful to everyone who helped us think through this. And Sabrina, once again, thank you. We didn't get to hear from you what you would miss, but uh, well, perhaps we'll hear that another time. Oh, do you want to say? I miss my museum <laughs> very much. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> For work and, and pleasure. Yeah. So many of us want to return to work and we can, and we can if we follow the science. So thank you very much for joining us. I'm going to turn it back to our own Emily Hussell. Hi everyone and thank you so much Tim. Um, so I am just here to once again give a big thank you to our fantastic panelists, to our moderator, and to all of you who asked such amazing great questions. So thank you all again for being here. I'm giving you a virtual round of applause. I wish you could hear it but at least you can see it. So this event is the final of three town halls in a series focused on vaccination decisions. We hope you enjoy this series and that we will see you at future town hall discussions. If you would like to stay up to date on our museum programming around COVID-19, you can visit mos.org slash coronavirus. 
We will now stop streaming to Facebook and YouTube. Thank you all and see you again next time. For those of you here on 